is good everybody welcome to an epic my damn toys video today i have your wwe backlash 2020 review for you guys taking place tonight we have the greatest wrestling match ever right randy orton and edge would that live up to the hype would it even be decent would it be good let's find out together coming into this show not a ton of matches i was looking forward to but you guys already know i stated every time this happens that usually when that's the case the show ends up being a lot better than i expect it to be would backlash 2020 meet that same requirement we're going to find out here together. I'm going to run through the entire Backlash 2020 card, breaking down everything that happened. I'm going to break down everything that happened at the show. We're going to get into the feuds themselves going in. I'm going to let you know what I personally thought of the matches coming in, what I thought of the matches as they progressed, as they took place on the show. Let you guys know about any sick attires, the results of the match, where I think we go from here. Was it bollocks? Was it great? And everything in between. So let's dive into Backlash 2020 and give you my own personal opinions on everything that took place. So apparently the kickoff show started at like 5 or 5.30. I thought the kickoff show would start at 6. So I was late to the party. Also, the United States Championship match between Apollo Crews and Andrade was on the pre-show instead of the main show. Very upsetting about that. You know, I really wanted to watch this match. I completely missed it because the show started earlier than I thought. And I didn't figure this match would be on the pre-show. I thought for sure that the Street Profits and Viking Raiders would be on the pre-show. And this was on the pre-show. Apollo does retain the U.S. Championship, which I'm very glad of. However, I really wanted to see this match, so I did not get to watch this match. Very disappointed with that, but at least Apollo is still your United States champion, and I'm pretty upset that this wasn't on the main show. I know it doesn't matter that much, but hopefully he will move on to the main card after retaining and, you know, building up Incredible as a champion. But Apollo Crews does retain the U.S. Championship, and my boy KO was on commentary for this matchup, so I'm guessing maybe KO versus Apollo is next. I'm not sure. So our main show does start off with the Women's Tag Team Championship match between Bayley and Sasha Banks taking on the Iconics and Bliss and Cross Applesauce is what I've been hearing them called. So Bliss, Cross Applesauce, the Iconics, and Bayley and Sasha tying up in a triple threat tag team championship match here for the Women's Tag Team Championships. Wasn't looking forward to this match coming in. Just not invested. I cannot get behind Bliss and Cross as a team and the Iconics as a team. Just the characters and the way they interact and everything like that. It's just not good. The Women's Tag Team Division is bad. The Women's division right now as a whole is pretty bad and I'm just waiting on the Bailey Sasha feud that we are inevitably going to be getting going into the summer but in this matchup we had some pretty crazy stuff take place I remember one time Peyton Royce like dived to the outside like a suicide dive and it looked brutal like um, it was just it was kind of weak of her coming through and it made it where everybody kind of fell and it looked pretty brutal to be honest with you not in a good way though it looked like it was like Jesus Christ somebody could have got hurt but nonetheless Bailey and Sasha do retain Alexa Bliss goes for the twisted Bliss off the top rope. She lands it on Peyton Roy. Sasha Banks comes out of nowhere and gets the roll-up pin on Alexa Bliss, and Bailey and Sasha are still your tag team champions. I agree with this sentiment. I wasn't invested in the few going forward. Not sure where we go from here as far as another tag team coming forward for these guys to face, but I'm just glad that Bailey and Sasha did retain. I mean, you guys know how I feel about the women's tag titles anyway. They shouldn't have been created, but here we are with the tag titles, and at least they're on some credible champions. Next up, guys, we had a match that I was most looking forward to, I believe, on the show besides Randy Orton and Edge. We had Jeff Hardy, my man, taking on Sheamus in a matchup that has pretty much had some blood feud in it, man. We've had some freaking deep storyline coming in here. Sheamus was bringing up Jeff's dark past and, you know, his demons that he's been facing for years and years about his alcohol abuse and his drug abuse and his DUIs and all of this different stuff. Jeff Hardy threw piss in Sheamus' face. I mean, I was actually invested in this, man. I thought the realism of it and the elements in both guys going back and forth over the multiple weeks leading up to the matchup was excellent. I think that both of these guys brought it into this feud. I was invested in this feud and the match totally lived up to the hype. If you guys missed this matchup, you definitely need to check it out if you didn't watch Backlash at all. I would go back just to watch this matchup. It was a fun match. Hard hitting. You guys know Sheamus' style. It's my style that I love to watch. Jeff's one of my faves of all time. So, I mean, this was a great mixture of a great matchup with some physicality, a lot of great selling, some great counters. It was a really fun matchup between the two. It lived up to the hype for me. At the end of the match, Jeff is running along the barricade looking to do his signature move where he jumps off and dives onto the guy. Sheamus hits him with a broke kick out of midair, puts him in the ring, one more broke kick, and then pins him one, two, three. So Sheamus does come out on top, and Corey Graves actually mentioned on commentary, he said, and the fans are disappointed once again in Jeff Hardy, like Jeff Hardy messed up again, kind of, and I was like, damn, that's kind of effed up, but maybe they're trying to redeem him here after this. I don't know where we go from 
from here, to be honest with you. Jeff was seen in the corner kind of contemplating and stuff. They even mentioned it on commentary, so maybe we're trying to get a redemption story out of him. I'm not sure. But this matchup was nice. I enjoyed it. And it actually looked like at the three count, Jeff's right shoulder was up. I don't know if anybody else missed that or watched that. If you guys go back and watch it on the network, I swear to God, his right shoulder was off the ground at the three count. But I don't know. Somebody go check out for me and let me know, stupid camera falling. But anyways, guys, Sheamus does beat Jeff Hardy, and we'll see where we go from here. Next up, guys, was the Raw Women's Championship match between the GOAT Asuka going up with my least favorite wrestler. We have my favorite women's wrestler going up against my least favorite in Nia Jax. And Nia Jax, everybody knows the rep. You know, she's usually an unsafe worker. She's just, I, I don't know, man. It's hard to describe. Just not not very good. But anyways, guys, we get into the matchup. This matchup, uh, I wasn't invested in it at all. I didn't think that Nia deserved this championship match to begin with. I wasn't invested in it, so it was kind of hard to get through. It was hard hitting, I guess you could say. Asuka and Nia are both kind of aggressive in their style, so that was nice to see, but outside of that, I was not invested in it in, you know, uh, waiting on the edge of my seat. I was just ready for it to be over, to be honest with you. The matchup ends in a double countout. Both ladies go to the outside. It ends in a double countout. I really didn't notice what happened. I think they both got slammed and kicked in the face or something, and they both go to the outside. Double countout happens, and Asuka retains the championship, but I think this could be a ploy all to get Charlotte involved. You know, these two get a rematch. Charlotte comes out I was like, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was next in line. And then they add Charlotte, and then Asuka gets kept strong because she doesn't take the pin in the triple threat. Nia would then take the pin, leading to Charlotte winning the championship, and Asuka would be kept strong because she wouldn't be pinned by Charlotte. I could totally see that happening. That sounds abysmal to me. Do not want to see that, but I don't want to see this matchup either. So, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. This is what I was saying. The women's division is just not good right now, man. And I really don't know what to do to fix it. Maybe not put all the focus on Charlotte. Maybe get some new faces up in here but anyways Oscar does retain thank Christ and we're moving on to the next one Next up, guys, we have the Blue Universal Championship match between Braun Strowman in a handicap match versus Miz and Morrison. Now, coming into this, wasn't invested at all. You know, it was all about the pranks and the music videos and the craziness and just kind of a comedic, lame attempt at a feud here between these two, or three guys, I should say, these two-on-one guys here for the Blue Universal title. And I was not invested in this until the matchup happened. I even tweeted something about it. It's like Morrison in the ring with Braun Strowman was kind of magical. Like, I loved watching it the way, like, the, the agility and the speed and the athleticism of John Morrison just rolling all around the ring and Strowman trying to catch up with him and grabbing him out of midair and stuff like that. It was very entertaining. I tweeted something out like, uh, it's like a matchup that I never knew I needed until now. Now I want to see Braun Strowman and, and Morrison go for like 15 minutes. But overall, I enjoyed the match for what it was. I found myself more invested than I thought I would be. It was a lot better than I thought it would be. The only thing that I did not like was that at the end of the matchup, John Morrison and The Miz hit the little, you know, the, the springboard skull crushing finale drop kick stomp type deal that John Morrison and uh, Miz like to do as their finisher. Morrison was the legal man so he went for the cover and at the two mark Miz drags Morrison off and he's like oh my god what the hell am I doing and then Morrison is like what the hell bro what the hell trying to you know I guess put some cracks in the foundation of the tag team but am I supposed to believe that that pinfall was supposed to put Braun away and and that was going to be it before that? I don't think so man I just don't buy that especially after we've seen Braun get speared three or four times by Goldberg and not get beat. We've seen him in the chamber take like a curb stomp and a coup de gras and a spear by Roman Reigns. Still get covered by all three men and still kick out at two. So I, I was not buying that. The logic was definitely not there on that. And that's why I could not buy into that story they were trying to tell me right there. I wasn't buying it. I wasn't smelling what they were stepping in, if you will. But this matchup was better than I thought. Braun ended up hitting the power slam, choke slam, one, two, three. Braun does retain the Blue Universal title. We all saw it coming. I guess we're going to wait for the Fiend to come back to take off the title, or I don't know where we're going from here, but Braun does beat Miz and Morrison in a two-on-one effort. Next up, we have the WWE Championship match between Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley with, of course, MVP in his corner, Lana, backstage saying that, you know, she was debating whether or not to come down to the ring, MVP talking to her, and this match was pretty physical, man. I felt like that was the theme of the night, just a bunch of physical matchups, pretty decent football game right here. I thought it was hard-hitting like I expected it to be. I found myself invested in it, coming into it, not that invested, but, but they made a believer out of me by the end of the matchup. I thought it was hard-hitting. I liked the story they were telling 
Allen here. Before the matchup even began, Lashley locked in the full Nelson, which was part of the storyline, you know, like how dangerous that move is. He locked it in before the match and sort of got the heel kicks in, you know what I'm saying, coming in before the bell even rang. Uh, Drew McIntyre even still had his entrance gear on, so he was at ta he was taking advantage of that, but it was a hard-hitting game, man. The, the end of the matchup, though, I was kind of confused on. I didn't really like because Lana comes down and gets on the apron, and it distracts Bobby Lashley. Bobby Lashley looks at her and is talking to her. Get the hell out of here. Drew McIntyre hits Bobby Lashley with a headbutt, knocking Lashley into Lana, knocking Lana and MVP into the floor, and then he gets hit with a Claymore kick, one, two, three. So it was kind of like not a completely clean win, I guess, for Drew, which I don't like. I wish he would have pretty much just put Bobby down, put MVP down, put him all down with those distractions anyway. I don't like that, you know, it kind of required Bobby Lashley to look away, but I guess they're trying to build up Lashley as a pretty credible threat. Drew McIntyre does hit the Claymore kick and wins. One, two, three, retains the WWE Championship. Thank Christ. I'm very happy with this result. I think it's the right result. I don't think they're going to take the title off of Drew until at least full crowds come back because I think, you know, he, I, I've said it time and time again that he never got his moment in front of the live crowds. He got it at the Rumble, but as champion, he really needs that moment, and I don't think that we are going to uh, get him away from the title until those crowds come back. So, Drew McIntyre still on fire. He even got on the camera, in the camera's face after the matchup and said, I'm going to be WWE champion for a long, long time. I'm a believer in it. I like it. He retains, and I, I enjoyed this for what it was. Next up, guys, we have the Raw Tag Team Championship match between the Viking Raiders and the Street Profits, and my God in heaven, you wanted to take Apollo Crews and Andrade off the main show for this? This is absolutely a kickoff show segment or match. I don't know what the hell I just watched. It was not a match whatsoever. The Raw Tag Team Championship division is gone. There's no, It doesn't even exist. We thought the Women's Tag Team Championships were booked like jokes. <laughs> Bro, holy Christ. I don't know what the hell I just watched. I wasn't already invested in the anything you can do, I can do better BS they've been doing for weeks upon weeks. The comedy cringe, the different segments of playing golf and all this ish. And then and then we get like random crap and, and this right here made no sense. They were in the hallway and then they had a bowling ball like they were about to go to war and then Montez Ford gets hit in the nuts with the bowling ball and they're going back and forth. They finally make their way to the parking lot and Akira Tozawa is there in a ninja outfit with a bunch of other ninjas on motorcycles or or street bikes, and then they all get together. The Viking Raiders and the Street Profits get together. They become the Viking Profits, and they say they want the smoke, and they draw chicken legs and, and different items that they're using, basically like the Avengers. The ninjas attack. They beat the hell out of the ninjas, and then Akira Tozawa ends up with this big old dude with a mask on, and he had a katana, and then all four of the Street Profits and the Viking Raiders run away, and then they climb on top of this truck, and they jump into the bed of a garbage truck, and then they have dream sequences. It was completely all over the place. I have no idea what I just watched. I was not invested. I just wanted it to end. It kind of seemed like I was watching a children's show or something. I, I, I really don't know what to say. If you guys watch this, you definitely know what I'm talking about. You definitely need to go watch it so you can understand the, the gravity of what I'm saying. But this was not good. This was not good, and I hate that I even had to spend time talking about it. And for a minute, of it, guys, we had the greatest wrestling match ever. Build so by WWE, Randy Orton and Edge, two of my favorites of all time, doing war here for the hundredth time in their careers, right? We had the match take place at WrestleMania. That was more of a stipulation style matchup. That was all over the place, more of a hardcore extreme rules style match. This was supposed to be a true wrestling match, Randy Orton telling Edge, yeah, you may have beat me at Mania, but can you beat me in a true wrestling match? You can't beat me in a real wrestling match. Edge accepts. These guys have done a fantastic job going back and forth in this in this feud. I think that their mic work and the segments and the going back and forth on the peep show, all of it was fantastic. I don't really have to get too invested because I already was to begin with. I, I love both of these guys so much, what they've done in their careers and they brought me in even further, but could it live up to the hype of the greatest wrestling match ever? This was a damn good match. This was, this was good stuff, man. If you missed this match, you definitely want to go back and check it out. At the start of the match, they they had Howard Finkel's voice somehow billing both of these guys, I guess, from way back when. I'm not sure how they were able to do that. But they had him chime in. They gave it a big match feel. They even added in audio from the crowd at times, which I don't mind. I really don't mind that. I hope they do that for the NBA when sports return. I want to hear the crowd. I don't give a shit if I can't see them or not. I like to hear them. I like to see the interaction. And when a big move happens and stuff, I like to hear the crowd react, even if they're not even there. You can't really see it anyway, so it's not a big deal to me. But through this match, man, these guys had counter 
counters for everything. Tons of near falls, tons of finishers, just some true grit in this match. Randy Orton was busted open at one point. Edge's gear was super fire with like the black, green, and red. It was super sick. I mean, these guys threw everything at each other. Pedigrees, rock bottoms, three amigos, all the signatures, all the finishers. I mean, this thing was sick. I did hear, however, this is kind of a spoiler, but I did hear that, that Edge supposedly tore his tricep in this match. I'm not sure if that's completely true yet, but I did hear that on the on the grapevine. So if that is true, I guess this is a good way to write him off TV for a little bit. I think that injury requires like four to six months of healing to come back from. I do hate that for Edge, but he is in still tremendous shape. He can easily go, as long as his neck is fine, he can go another five to ten years. No BS. I think he's that damn good. This man put it on the line tonight. Both men beat the hell out of each other. Super physical, super fun match. You definitely want to go watch this if you missed it. I, I might say between this and Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles, these, those are the best two matches you're going to see in an empty arena so far this year. This might have been match of the year in my opinion so far on the main roster. I mean, these guys beat the hell out of each other. Super fun. Greatest wrestling match ever? I don't know. Probably not, but a damn good match, man. Found myself super invested. It was great. I, I loved it through and through. Super classic. I mean, these guys had to have gone 45 minutes, right? I mean, it was close to it. I loved it, man. It was good. At the end of the match, we got two spears by Edge. Wasn't enough to put Randy Orton away. Randy Orton hits him with an RKO and then punts him for the win. We bring back the punt kick. Even at one point in this match, Randy Orton got in Edge's ear and he whispered to him, he says, I'm going to effing kill you, mother effer. No, no BS. They played that audio on the WWE Network. I thought that was very sadistic and nice for them to plug that in there. I thought that was absolutely insane. But I like the edginess, man. I like edginess in my wrestling. I love it. That's why I love AEW so much. But damn, man, this was a fun match. If you missed this, you definitely want to go check it out. But Randy Orton wins with the punt kick to the head and it looks like Edge will be written off TV for a little bit, but damn, what a good football game. Damn, that's a good football game. Damn, that's a good ice cream. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. But Randy Orton wins with the punk kick in the greatest wrestling match ever. Overall, Backlash, I'd say we probably had two good matches, maybe. The rest was what it was. You know, I wasn't too invested in the show. A couple matches here and there, but I enjoyed the greatest wrestling match ever, and I'm looking forward to what we get on Monday night tomorrow night. But that does it for my review, guys. Thank you so very much for watching the Backlash review. Let me know what you thought of Backlash 2020 down in the comment section below. Did you like the greatest wrestling match ever? Thank you guys for watching. Subscribe to the channel. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at MyDamnToys. Monday Night Raw coming tomorrow. We'll find out what the hell's going on. And I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you.